Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's stand on our feet this Sunday morning. Can you clap your hands unto God? Come on, let's clap, clap, clap our hands. God is good. He's worthy to be praised. So glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We're able to feel the presence of God and worship together in the beauty of holiness. Praise God. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours yours is the kingdom O Lord and you are exalted as head over all does anybody want to exalt the Lord this morning come on can we lift our hands unto the Lord can we lift up our Savior can we lift up the victor can we lift up the one true God above everything else everything that we've come in with everything that we bring to his feet let's exalt the Lord let's magnify him let's glorify him let's praise him for he is worthy and he is worthy to be praised again let's clap our hands unto the Lord and let's worship with the praise team in Jesus name
I am just passing through. Earthly treasures soon will fade, but I found my hope in you. You are the one I want, you are the one I need. This world can have it all, it can take everything. good. Amen. We're going to go before the Lord right now and pray. The Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in the time of our greatest need. And we're going, I think I know a church that knows how to do that. Come boldly before the throne of grace. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Can we lift up our brothers and sisters right now? 
bind our voices together, lift up our hands and our hearts, and come boldly before the throne of grace for grace in every situation represented here. In the name of Jesus Christ, let's pray, Bible world. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We lift up every need on our pastor's prayer list today. Pray that you would touch every situation, every individual. Touch them where they're at, the deepest part of their need. Lift them, I pray. Encourage them, I pray. Strengthen them. Let, your, let them sense your presence right now and your grace flowing into their life. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, heal, I pray, and deliver and set free and give a testimony of your goodness, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for all of your goodness, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Clap your hands unto the Lord again. So good to be in God's presence. We want to welcome you into this worship service. Our one goal, what we want to see God do today, not only here, but for all of those that are watching online, we want to welcome them too, because we want to see God pour out His Spirit today. We want to see God meet your needs. Amen. There are several needs represented in this beautiful crowd, and God wants to meet every need. Somebody say amen. So we want to welcome you, and we want to remind you that this coming Sunday, everybody say May 28th, say next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. This is the day that God, that we celebrate and recognize when God poured his spirit out upon man. I love the scripture that says in Luke 24 that it behooved Christ to suffer and to die and to rise from the third day so that repentance and remission of sins could be preached in his name. Amen. Beginning at Jerusalem. So this next week, we're going to celebrate what God did, pouring out his spirit into man. And so what we did so so beautifully on Easter, we preached the gospel to well over 2,000 people on Easter Sunday. And that was our one goal. How many people can we preach the gospel to in one day? But on Pentecost Sunday, amen, the challenge to this church is how many people can we bring to the house of God that he would have the opportunity to pour out his spirit, that they would have the opportunity to hear the gospel preached, amen, to hear this new covenant message. And so today when you leave, we want to encourage you to pick up these beautiful invitations. They're outside. It's on a sign that reads, Jesus is too good to keep to yourself. Amen. Somebody clap your hands if you believe that. He's too good. And so we have these invitations that have all the service schedule on the back. And then it has a place for you to write your name. So when you invite, amen, that person that's checking you out at the grocery store, you're buying a coffee at 7-Eleven or Wawa, and you give them a card, make sure you write your name right down there. So when they come into our guest services next week and we receive them, we can say, we can sit, have them sit with you because that's what these are. These are sit with me card invitations to invite people to come and experience this great God who not only next week is going to pour out his spirit, but he's going to show himself powerful today. Somebody give God glory. Amen. Clap your hands and let's give God glory for all that he's going to do today and on Pentecost Sunday. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's do that again. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. It feels so good in the house of the Lord today. Amen. 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 It is that time of giving in our service. Leviticus 23 says, And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord. With two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. When we give, the Bible is telling us when we give, when we sacrifice to the Lord, our sacrifices become holy unto God. There is only one attribute in the Bible that the Bible tells, tells us we can emulate God, and that is be ye holy, for I am holy. There is something beautiful about giving. There is something that gets to the heart of God when we sacrifice unto him. And the word says when we give, 
it is holy. Praise the Lord. It's that time of giving in our service today. Amen. We are going to worship the Lord in our giving. How many have had a miracle from God? How many have had God do something, make a way out of no way? Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, thank you, God, for everything you've given us, God. Everything is for you and by you and because of you. And, God, today we give freely and we give in faith, God, and we give unto you, God. We give unto you to be grafted into holiness. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, bless everything that's given here today and bless your saints. And everybody said amen. Amen. Let's worship as we give. The musicians are going to play right now. When they play, you can give in the baskets on each side of me or online. Praise the Lord. Let's worship as we give.
Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. God is so, so, so good. We are so blessed to be loved of a great and wonderful God. How many times, how many ways do we walk around and think all this awful stuff must be because there is something wrong and instead come to realize that God still has it all under control. You may be seated. On Wednesday, we talked a little bit in the adult class about the, for, how was that titled? Because I said so. Talking about how when God speaks, everything that he speaks is what it is, and we don't get to judge it. We don't get to evaluate it. We don't get to say, you know what, I don't agree with, with this. I don't think there should be a rule. I don't think there should be a standard. I don't think this should be what we get to do. But one of the things that we do when we think about things like that is that we forget that God has also said a lot of things that benefit us, that are just as valid, just as true, just as holy, just as righteous as every other thing that says that we are messing up, that we're falling short. So I'm going to read to you a little bit about, about it in Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 53, the famous chapter, it bruised for, your, for our iniquities, he was wounded for our transgressions, by his stripes we are healed. He goes through that, sir, through that whole chapter talking about Jesus going to the cross and all the payment that he made for us. But now I'm going to show you the next chapter, how God treats this situation. And starting in verse 7, for a small moment, God says, have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. In a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you, saith the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with you nor rebuke you, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that has mercy on us. We cannot forget that when God says, I said this, we can't just look at the bad and say, you know what, I'm going to hang on to that and I'm just bad. We have to remember the good. God said that with mercy he would come to us, that he would run to us and hug us. At the end of that chapter, no, war, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. We have to hold on to those promises just like we hold on to his standards. So let's give God the praise and thank him for his wonderful mercies, for his wonderful goodness. Give a hand clap to the Lord as pastor comes and gives us the word. Somebody said praise the Lord. You know, it's actually a pleasure pastoring a church that loves the Word of God the way this church loves the Word of God. I know we like music, and God has blessed us with great music. Didn't our kids do a great job today? <laughs> Praise God. On a regular Sunday, today we call it Youth Takeover. We're letting the youth do the music, and they help in different areas one Sunday out of the month, but on the other Sundays, we have got the most fantastic music program around here you're ever going to hear. I promise you, God has been good to Bible World Church. We have wonderful worship here. Do you know there's a lot of folks that go to church just for that? They choose a church based on how they play the piano and the organ and how they beat the drums and pluck the bass and how their best singers sing. It's, it's their reason for going to church is they're a music nut. I know we've got good music and I thank God for that. But I know that this church comes here because you love the Word of God. And you know you're going to hear the Word of God in this house. Somebody said, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Let me underscore, and you can just remain standing a second or two, if you will, and we'll let you be seated for a while then after that. I want to underscore Brother Crouch's announcement today about Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is one of the most important days in the year. It is a celebration of the first Pentecost in the second chapter of the book of Acts. 
It is, as Brother Crouch said, our holiday. It belongs to us. It doesn't belong to anybody but apostolic Pentecostal people. Amen. And we are celebrating next Sunday morning and Sunday night in a very special way. Sunday morning, I'm asking you to do everything in your power this week to have somebody with you in church Sunday morning who has not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, who has not yet obeyed Acts 2.38. That's what we'll be preaching about. That's what we're expecting to happen. We're expecting people to be baptized. We're expecting people to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We're going to have a good time next Sunday morning, and our guest evangelist will be Brother Michael Easter on Sunday morning. Looking forward to his ministry. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost they were all in one place in one accord. You've heard me preach before that Pentecost couldn't happen until the church got together. There had to be a measure of unity before the Holy Ghost could be poured out as prophesied in the Scripture. Next Sunday night, that's what the service is going to be all about. It is a unity service. I don't know how many other apostolic churches will join us. There may be one, there may be none, there may be ten. I don't know yet how many exactly are going to be here with us. But we are inviting churches that are not United Pentecostal churches, but they are churches of like precious faith. That means they believe in Acts 2.38. They believe in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They believe in, be ye holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. They don't have a United Pentecostal church card in their pocket, but they believe the same thing we believe. And we're going to have a unity service next Sunday night for Tidewater of all of our churches that want to join with us here. Now, I want to explain to you. They are our guest when they come. They're not here for us to teach them anything. They're not here for us to help them. They're not here for us to show anything off. We're coming together as equals in the body of Christ. Doesn't matter that we're UPCI. We're coming together as equals in the body of Christ. I really need some of you's help this week to get the word out to everybody you know that is apostolic and invite them to be in that service on Sunday night. Again, Brother Michael Easter will be preaching Sunday morning and Sunday night. It is going to be a great day for Bible World Church. I wonder how many of you, I'd like to have at least a dozen a day, but how many of you would raise your hand and say, Pastor, Monday I will pray for next Sunday services. Would you hold your hand up? Way more than a dozen. How about Tuesday? You'll make a commitment to pray More than a dozen. Thank you. Wednesday, you'll pray about Sunday morning, Sunday night services. Thank you, thank you. How about Thursday? Thank you. Not quite a dozen. How about some more joining us on Thursday? There you go. Thursday, Friday. How many of you will pray Friday? Praise God. More than a dozen. Saturday. Saturday. Thank you. More than a dozen. Brother... Forrest and all of those involved in prayer, Sister Corey, Brother Ashton, uh, whether it's youth prayer, Monday prayer, ladies prayer, hyphen prayer, whatever kind of prayer it is this week, I want it to be focused on Sunday morning, Sunday night. Focus our prayer on what God's going to do Sunday morning, Sunday night. Sunday morning's for us. For Bible World Church, we're going to be here and we're going to bring people that need to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost on Sunday morning. Sunday night is a unity service because I believe God has put it in my heart that the apostolic churches of Tidewater need to come together in unity and we need to impact Hampton Roads for the cause of the apostolic message. Can somebody say amen?
June 3rd and 4th, I don't normally make announcements, but I am today because these are important. June 3rd and 4th, Saturday, June 3rd is minister's training. Sunday morning, Sunday night, June 4th is, is pow two powerful services. Our guest speaker for Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and Sunday night is Warren Finney. He is the man that was here with the quartet that used to be an Assembly of God pastor, married to an Assembly of God superintendent's daughter. God gave him a revelation of Jesus' name, baptism. He has rebaptized. Are you ready for this? He has rebaptized in Jesus' name 14 entire Assembly of God churches in Jesus' name. Again, this is a great time for you to invite your guests and your friends, people you're teaching Bible study with, people that you're talking to about the Scripture. Have them here that weekend. On Saturday, Brother Finney's got two very special messages that he's going to give to our ministers in training. You need to be here. Ministers in train, ministers training needs to be the priority of your life if you are in ministers training. Don't tell me me you want to be a minister and you miss half of all ministers trainings because you went fishing or some other something you're only telling your pastor you don't really want to be a minister hello and I'm good I've put out a bunch of ministers good ones I can't make a minister out of an unfaithful person I'm still making announcements. I haven't even started preaching yet. Please, if you will, make these two weekends the highlight of the next couple weeks. I know that when June hits, oh my Lord, the doors are going to fly open and we're going to go vacationing all over the country. And I don't begrudge you that. I've never told one human in all the years I pastored, don't take a vacation. When you tell me you're going on vacation, I say, that's great. Have a great time. You deserve it. And I'm going to take one and feel the same way, by the way. <laughs> but until we get past June 3rd and 4th, I'm asking you, focus. Focus on what God is doing in our church. Can you say amen? Amen. Shake hands with somebody and say, you know, he makes things pretty clear. <laughs> when I was a young man, I'm no longer that. But when I was a young man, I think my very favorite singing group, I had every album they ever made, was The Mighty Clouds of Joy. Now, most of you are too young to appreciate good music. I call our new songs we sing now 7-Eleven songs. They got seven words and we sing them 11 times. And instead of being written down on your knees in front of God, they're written in Starbucks on an iPad. Woo! Glory to God. I got to get out of this ornery mode before I start preaching. I can tell you that. I need a deliverance right now. <laughs> Mighty clouds of joy. It didn't matter if they were in a recording studio recording. You can depend on they were going to shout and dance and have a good time worshiping God. If they were at a church and they knew they were making a live recording, it didn't matter. Every now and then they had a little preaching and every now and then they gave an altar call and they always tried to have a move of God. But they were probably my favorite group. One of my greatest favorite pastor singers was Bishop G.E. Patterson. I love to hear him. I probably listened to him the last three days, maybe 20 or 30 songs that I've listened. And the song I'm going to preach about today, I've listened to, no joke, 25, 30, 50, 70 times, I don't know, in the last 30 days. This song came to my spirit early this past week. It's an old song. It's older than I am. It, it was sung before I was ever born, 65 years ago. 
And I am borrowing the title of this song that's been going over and over and over in my spirit all week long. I literally have woke up humming the words to walk with me, Lord. Walk with me, Lord. The song, I want Jesus to walk with me. I'm using that as my text today and I'm borrowing it from Mighty Clouds of Joy and Bishop Patterson. Everybody say with me, walk with me, Lord. Say it again, walk with me, Lord. The message that I'm going to preach to you today is the answer to whatever your question is in this house today. If you stand here today with more questions than you have answers, the answer is walk with me, Lord. If you stand here today and you are confused, the answer is walk with me, Lord. If you're here today and you're angry, you're frustrated, the answer is walk with me, Lord. If you've gathered in this house today and you've got troubles and trials everywhere you turn on every hand, the answer is walk with me, Lord. If you're here today facing sickness, if you're here today and you've lost a loved one, the answer is walk with me, Lord. If you're here today and you're facing challenges like you've never had to face before in your life, challenges that you do not know which way to turn or how to respond, the answer is put your hand in His hand and walk with me, Lord. Would you raise both your hands to heaven and let's love God together in this house. God, we want your will to be done among us today. More than we want anything else. We don't, we're not interested in anything else right now. But your will to be done in our lives. And oh God, we want you to walk with us. We want to walk with you. I pray you would help us today in this area. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody said in Jesus' name. The Bible says, don't be seated just yet. Deuteronomy 31 and 8. In the King James Version. It says, and the Lord. He it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee. Hence... I added that word. Hence, fear not, neither be dismayed. That word hence means for this reason. Let me give it to you again. Four powerful things God tells us He's going to do. He said, I'll go before you. I'll be with you. I will not fail you. And I will not forsake you. I'm saying hence. Or for this reason. Fear not. And neither be dismayed. You may be seated. There are several references in your Bible to people who had a great relationship with God and were dependent upon God. And it's very easy to surmise that, that they walked with God. There's only two people in your Bible that the Bible actually says of them. They walked with God. The Bible said Enoch walked with God. And then later it says Noah walked with God. There's something powerful about walking with God. When you are the type of person that starts every day. By saying, God, I want to walk with you today. I want you to direct my steps. I want you to guide my way. I want you to direct my thoughts. I want you, oh God, to open the right doors and close the ones that would be wrong for me to go through. I want you, God, to walk with me. I want you, God, to direct my steps. There are powerful benefits in having that kind of relationship with God. Walking with God provides us unmatched guidance and wisdom. 
I'm a reader. I love to read. I read the New York Sun every day of the world. I read that new 1440 thing that's out every single day of the world. I listen to the news every single day of the world. About all I'm getting out of it in May of 2023 is I get done listening and watching and reading madder than I was before I started. I'm not getting any guidance out of it. I'm not getting any direction out of it. You can ask Aunt Jane and Uncle John what you ought to do, and you might get good advice and you might not. You can follow the direction your peers are going, and you may end up in the right place and you may end up in the wrong place. You may try to please your family, and you may end up okay, and you may end up not okay, following even your family. But can I tell you that walking with God provides us unmatched guidance and wisdom. God's guidance, my friend, will navigate us through the complexities of this life. And I don't need to tell anybody in this house, we're living in the most complex age in the history of the world but you're not alone if you're walking with God it doesn't matter what's happening in Washington it don't matter what's happening in Russia it don't matter what's happening in China it don't matter what's happening in Ukraine honey if you're walking with God He's going to guide your steps He's going to direct your way clap your hands and shout yes Walking with God means we're going to have His guidance. And God's guidance enables us to make sound decisions. Hello? I saw some of our kids the other day doing rock, paper, scissors. They were trying to make a decision what they were going to do and who they were going to listen to. And all of our kids standing out there in the hallway, you know, going, trying to decide who's winning. Isn't it amazing how many adults kind of do this? You may not be doing this, but you're kind of making your decisions the same way. Let's just take a chance on this. Let's just listen to three or four people and try to figure out who might be right. Let's just see what the, who gets the short straw or the long straw here. And that's the way that I'm going to go. Something about walking with God. You need to hear what I'm telling you today. In a world that has never been more unsure, unstable. In a world that's never been more messed up. I am speaking this morning to the most privileged people on the face of the earth. Because you have the opportunity to walk with God and let Him. Him guide your steps. Say amen, somebody. God's guidance ensures that we will overcome all obstacles. Hello? I may not know. I may not be able to tell you, give you direction of going right, going left, going forward, going backwards. How many steps to take this way, take a turn? How many? I may not be able to give you the kind of direction that you need, but I want to assure every one of you this day that if before you leave here today you renew your commitment to Him, or if you've never made a commitment to Him, you make one today. And that commitment needs to be simple, not complex. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want to walk with God. Walk with me, Lord. That's what I want. Jesus said in John 8 and 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Walk with Him. Walk with the Lord. Walking with God develops and strengthens our relationship with God. I will be married November the 4th this year, 45 years. That girl right over there. When we started, I was the man of the house. Why are you laughing? You don't know what I was fixing to say. (laughs) 
Let me tell you, you don't have a good marriage if you don't communicate. You don't have a good friendship if you don't communicate. You're not doing real good on the job if you don't communicate with your fellow workers. Communication is the oil that keeps the wheel turning smoothly. And it's amazing to me how many people think they can walk with God, but they never communicate with God. You ought to talk with Him all the time. You don't have to say, well, 6 o'clock in the morning is my prayer time. 7 o'clock it's done. And I don't got to worry about prayer again for 24 more hours. That's praying wrong. You're wasting your time praying if that's how you pray. Prayer is supposed to be communication with God. And walking with God develops and it strengthens our relationship and our communication with God. I know Pentecostals don't like what I'm saying because we've all been taught pray six o'clock in the morning every morning, pray one hour a day, pray an hour a day. You know what we've created? We've created a society that thinks when I've done that, I've done all I'm supposed to do and I don't have to do no more. In fact, most of us that do that, we're praying like this. Oh, Jesus, got nine more minutes. Oh, Jesus, God help me. Hallelujah, got eight more minutes. Oh, hallelujah. That's wasting your breath. Go get in your car, drive off, go do something. You're wasting your time. God don't want that kind of cookie cutter chatter from you. He wants you to communicate with Him. He wants you to have a relationship with Him. That means when you're driving the car down the road by yourself and you get to thinking about something you don't have an answer for, that you start talking in that car to the Lord like you would talk to your best friend. Lord, I need some direction. I don't know what to do here. I don't know where to go. I don't, I'm feeling horrible. I'm going through a mess. I promise you, when you do that, God's going to be there. God's going to answer you. You're not looking at the clock. You're not just saying a bunch of stuff. I was praying with a group of preachers, and one of our preachers is over in the corner. I'm not making fun. Well, maybe I am. But he's over in the corner praying, Oh, God. We're having an hour prayer meeting. He only said two words about a thousand times. Oh, God. And when he's trying to prolong the time, and it'd be, Oh, God. Come on, go get you an ice cream cone at Dairy Queen. You're not doing nothing. I promise you if you'll call on him in the time of trouble, he'll be there. I promise you that if you'll communicate with him on a regular basis. How about when you're going down the road? These men that travel with me, they can tell you. I'll be driving down the road, one of them driving. I'm in the passenger seat, and I might just say out loud, I love you, Lord Jesus. Any of you men ever been smart enough to say that to your wife for no apparent reason? I love you, babe. Pays big dividends, don't it? It works. It helps. Well, guess what? God feels the same way. I love you, Lord. You don't have to have a reason for saying it. There doesn't have to be anything going on. But I promise you, He likes that more than He likes. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm thinking God's in heaven going, what? Hello? Hello? Walking with God develops and strengthens our relationship and our communication with Him. Walking with God empowers a child of God to resist temptation. It empowers a child of God to overcome the flesh. It empowers a child of God to live a life of righteousness. You say, preacher, I've been struggling in those areas. Temptation's about eating my lunch. Preacher, this flesh is out of control. Preacher, my life isn't as righteous as it ought to be. Then I want to tell you today, the answer is walk with me, Lord. I want to walk with you. I want to walk with you every day. 
If your interpretation and opinion of religion is Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, Sunday evening 6 o'clock, back Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, and when I've done that, I've fulfilled my obligation to God, then you really don't understand what it means to walk with the Lord. Walking with the Lord is a 24 hour a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year proposition. Clap your hands, somebody, and shout yes. Walking with God supplies divine courage and comfort in times of pain and suffering. It supplies divine courage and comfort in times of attack and adversity, in times of sickness and of loss, in times of confusion. I'm here to tell you that walking with God can answer our problems today. You say, preacher, that's a simple answer. I'm looking for a more complex answer. Honey, there is no answer more important than walking with the Lord. Walk with me, Lord. Can fix whatever's going on in your life. It can answer every challenge in your life. It can calm your spirit. It can repent place your joy it can empower you in the Holy Ghost the answer is walk with me Lord is my grand boy Asher where's Asher I saw him a little bit ago come up here buddy come up here with Papa he likes to help me preach come on man there you go get on up here I want every one of my ministers in training to watch how he responded. (laughs) While y'all walk up here like you need a good dose of Geritol. Elisa, I should have put these pictures and video up for you. Elisa sent me a picture just a week or two ago, two or three weeks ago. And she said, I heard the boys making a lot of racket in the family room so she said i walked to the door of the family room see what they were doing and there's little jacks with his hands up in the air two years old hands up in the air and here's asher with his hand on jack's head and he's screaming receive ye the holy ghost (laughs) she snapped a picture and went back to her work then she heard him again And she went and stood in the same door. They didn't know she was there. She stood in the door and did a video this time because Asher is introducing. Here's what he's saying out loud. Come on up here, Brother Kleindens, and tell these people how to get the Holy Ghost. And Lisa said, who's Brother Kleindens? He said, Jax. She said, well, who are you? He said, I'm Papa. So I asked him last night, I said, you want to help Papa preach tomorrow? He said, I sure do. My next point is that walking with God supplies divine protection and safety. You could worry a whole lot less about whether or not your family's safe and you're safe if you just walk with the Lord. Because walking with the Lord is where safety is. And protection comes from. You've seen Asher come up here during altar service. He wants to get my hand and he wants to walk back and forth with me. And I want him to. Because someday when I'm an old man walking on two canes and can't make it past the front row, I'm going to sit there and tears run down my face while it's him in the pulpit preaching to you. I want him to be used to this platform. I want him to be used to being in front of people. I want him to feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. But this isn't the only place he holds my hand. When we go to the restaurant, we get out of the cars. I try to always park close to their mama's car because I want the two boys to walk with me. And I'll get them in either hand and I'll say, hold Papa's hand. Don't you let go of my hand. You walk with me. When we come to the road, I'm teaching both boys, look that way, and now look this way. And I ask them, can we go? 
And they tell me, yeah, Papa, we can go. There's no cars coming. What are you doing, Brother Cunningham? Number one, I'm keeping them safe. I want them to know that if they've got a hold of Papa's hands, they're safe. I want them to know no car's going to hit them. Nobody's going to abduct them. I got interviewed by Time Magazine, what? Right at COVID time. Time Magazine. They were asking me about the bathroom question. Men going in women's bathrooms. And I told them. I said, let me tell you how I believe. I said, if my granddaughter, 12 years old, my daughter, 38 and none of your business years old, and my wife, who is celebrating the 25th anniversary of her 39th year. I told Time Magazine, I said, if my granddaughter, my daughter, or my wife goes into a bathroom, I stand outside the bathroom. You ask my family. And I dare some man, I don't care what he feels like today. I dare a man to try to go in with my grandbaby. I told my granddaughter, I said, I said, some boy does something he ain't supposed to do. Some man says something to you he isn't supposed to say. You need to look him straight in the eye and say, have you ever met my papa? Because when my papa finds out about this, you're going to be in trouble. You say, oh, Brother Cunningham, preachers aren't supposed to talk like that. Have you ever read the Old Testament? Have you ever read your Bible about how a man takes care of his house? How a man protects his own? How a man protects his wife and his children? I don't know how you feel about it. But if some retarded, ignorant, stupid, grade-A, homogenized igmo came in our house with the desire to hurt my children, my wife, my family. They would have to kill me first. They better hope they don't just disable me. We saw three guys the other day, my wife and I did. What, a week or two ago we were traveling? Three hoodlums harassing people. And I told my wife, I said, you walk with me. You stay here by me. She said, now, Jack, don't do nothing. Jack, don't, do, don't say nothing. Don't, don't. And I said, I ain't going to say nothing. I ain't going to do nothing. But if they come over here, I don't know if I can whoop all three of them. But one of them's leaving here in an ambulance. Now, how many of you men... Feel that way about your family, what I just said. Can I get a response from the men in the house? Jesus said, if your child asks for an egg, will you give them a stone? If they ask for a bread, will you give them a stone? If they ask for an egg, would you give them a scorpion? The answer is absolutely not. I'm not giving nothing bad to my own children. And Jesus looks at a group of men and said, If ye then, being carnal, know how to give good gifts to your family, how much more will your Father which is in heaven take care of you, give good gifts to you? What are you trying to say, preacher? That is that if you can relate to a dad or a papa that will protect you at any cost, can you not think the same way about your heavenly Father that if you'll walk with Him, walk with Him, He's going to protect you He's going to take care of you. He's going to care about what matters most to you. Clap your hands if this makes sense and say amen. David said in Psalm 23 and 4, Even if I walk through a very dark valley, I will not be afraid. Why, David? Because you are with me. Boy, this is kind of dark days we're living in. 
It's like I get a half a dozen calls a week of darkness visiting folks, visiting family, visiting marriages, visiting finances, visiting their children that they love more than life itself. These are dark days, but David said to God, if I walk through a very dark valley, I will not be afraid because you are with me. The answer is walking with the Lord. Does anybody hear me? The answer is walking with the Lord. Put your hand in His hand. Put your hand in His hand. And when you come up to danger, He's going to say, no, 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 no. Be careful here. And if you learn to walk with Him, and you learn to listen to Him, if you learn His voice honey he's going to take care of you no matter how dark the day is Isaiah said in Isaiah 41 and 10 God is speaking Isaiah is writing in the good news translation of the scripture do not be afraid I am with you I am your God let nothing terrify you I will make you strong and help you. I will protect you and save you. Most important words in that verse. I am with you. Walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord. So, oh, preacher, I talk in tongues every Sunday morning. That ain't walking with the Lord. We drag it out now and dance every Sunday night. That ain't walking with the Lord. We have convinced ourselves that, that, that coming to church is like getting high on drugs. It's our fix. It's a spiritual fix. That's like the drug addict gets every day or two or three out there in the world. It's just a temporary high. That isn't what God wants for you. God wants you to put your hand in His hand and walk with the Lord. He said, I'm going to be with you. Let nothing terrify you. I will make you strong and help you. I will protect you and save you. When and how? When I'm with you. When you're walking with me. When you're walking with me every day, that's when that promise kicks in. Am I making sense to anybody today? Walk with the Lord. David again in Psalm 37, 23 and 24. The Lord guides us in the way we should go and protects those that please Him. If we fall, they will not stay down because the Lord will help them up. I'm going to guess that 90 plus percent of the people in this room have never focused on the last six words of that verse. The Lord will help them up. Did you get that? There's no reason to get up if you haven't fallen down. There's no reason to get up if you're not already down. And God, we got it in our minds... I, I, I feel bad sometimes saying something like this. I'm United Pentecostal Church, head to toe. I believe it's the absolute best thing there is out there. But if you think we ain't got some traditions that need to be challenged, you're wrong. Yes, sir. Hello? We've come to understand that, well, when I'm down, I've done something wrong. When I'm down, it's the will of the Lord for me to be down. He gets glory out of me being down. What I get? One preach it, one come on. That come on after I said don't count. You know that, right? We got it in our mind that being flat of our face, wailing and crying and miserable to the nth degree is somehow in God's plan for us. But what God said, He said, because the Lord will help them up if you know where God wants to be in your life when you fall he wants he he didn't say get up boy get up boy I said get up boy no the Lord will help them up 
Simon Peter said, there's a spirit walking toward the boat on the water. And everybody in his boat got afraid because they assumed it was some spirit. Finally, Peter said, you know, that looks like Jesus. And he calls out, Jesus. And Jesus said, be not afraid, it's I. And Simon Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, come on. Now, Peter never gets credit for this, but let me draw the picture for you. Peter climbed out of the boat, went down the outside of the boat, and when he got to the water, still holding on the boat probably, he puts one foot down, lets go of the boat, and the Bible said Simon Peter was walking on the water to meet Jesus. You've never heard a sermon on that, have you? We've heard lots of sermons about, and he began to sink. Took his eyes off the Lord. Focused on the wind and the rain and the waves. And he began to sink. Because that's our human nature. But I want to point out to you, until he got his eyes on the wind and the waves and the rain, he was walking on the water. And as far as I know, he's the only human that ever has. What did Jesus do when Simon got to looking at the trouble? When Simon got to looking at the wind and the waves? When Simon allowed fear to get in his mind and heart? When he allowed human understanding, people can't walk on water, take over in his mind? The Bible said he began to sink. And as he was going down, he holds out a hand and says, Lord! Save me! And what's the Bible say? Help me, buddy. What's the Bible say? It said Jesus held his hand out and took him by... It's in the book. Jesus took him by the hand. And what's the rest of the verse say? He lifted him up. I'll bet you money you've never heard a message on the rest of that story. What happened after Jesus lifted him up? We already know he got out of the boat over there. That he walked part way to Jesus. That he went down. Jesus extended a hand and lifted him up. Only one of two or three things could have happened. Either Jesus picked him up and carried him back to the boat. Or Jesus went down in the water and they swam back to the boat. Or else Simon Peter put his hand in the hand of the Lord. And together... They walked back to the boat. That whole story, you need to get it in your brain. When Simon Peter went down, he was smart enough to say, Lord, save me. And the Bible said Jesus stretched forth his hand and he lifted him up. Jesus didn't kick him. Jesus didn't scold him. Jesus didn't threaten him. Jesus didn't challenge his faith. He extended a hand. And the Lord will help them up. I'm preaching to somebody today that you've fallen more times than you've got up. The verse of Scripture in the Bible says that a man falls six times, but a wise man gets up seven. What's that mean? Got up one more time than he fell. And that's all that matters. We're not keeping count of how many times anybody falls. The only thing that matters is did you get up one more time than you fell? Did you get up one more time than you fell? And when you got up, did you put your hand in His hand? Because the insurance against continually falling is walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Somebody shout, I love Him. Many years ago, I read a poem entitled Footprints in the Sand. It's a poem by Margaret Fishback Powers. I'll read it. It's short. It starts this way. One night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. 
one belonging to me and one belonging to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, that you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. The Lord whispered, my precious child, I love you and I will never leave you. Never, ever, during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. I'm telling somebody today the answer is walking with the Lord. The answer is I want Jesus to walk with me. The answer is walk with me, Lord. I want to walk with you, not just on Sunday and Wednesday, but Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Every day of my life, I want to walk with the Lord. The guy that wrote it, Gary Paxton, was an old hippie that had some kind of relationship with God midlife. But he wrote a song that said he was there all the time. He was there all the time. And one of the verses says, waiting patiently in line. And his testimony was that while he was a drug addict, while he was in trouble, while he was doing everything the devil wanted him to do, God was there all the time. He was waiting for me. I remember the first time I heard that song. It was on an old-fashioned phonograph. You know, the big black, Amaris came home from first grade and told me, said, Papa, my teacher had a CD today that was that big. <laughs> I remember standing in front of that old record player in the living room and that song's on it. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line while I did all my sin and all my mess. I literally, boom, hit the side of the record player and the needle bing, skipped across that record. I turned around and announced to those in the living room, I was all of about 15, 16 years old, trying to be spiritual. I turned around and said, my God, don't wait in line for nobody. That's just sacrilegious. God's waiting in line for you. And then all of a sudden it hit me. Where was he when I was acting like a devil? How many times did he reach for me? How many services was I in and I felt the presence of the Lord when I didn't deserve it? How many times did I feel the urge, the drawing of the Spirit of God to run to an altar and make things right with Him? He was there all the time. You say, preacher, I've made mistakes. He's still there. Preacher, I fell on my face. He's still there. And He wants to help you up. Preacher, I failed God. He's still there. One of the most precious saints in our church that's going through a terrible time right now called me on the phone this week and said, and I'll leave it very general so I don't, so I don't in any way say something I shouldn't say about them. But this precious saint of God said, I feel like a failure. I feel like I don't have faith in God. I'm questioning God right now. I'm asking God, why this and why that? I said to that precious saint of God, I said, there ain't nothing wrong with questioning God. She said, every preacher I've ever heard preach said, don't you dare question God. I said, what verse did they use? Because the Bible says God questioned God. On the cross, Jesus said, why hast thou forsaken me? Hold on. 
Get your arrogance under control. You can't come up with a question that will baffle God. You can't think up a question that will frustrate God. You can't come up with a question that God don't know where it's coming from and why. He created you. He knows everything about you. And your questions don't scare Him. They don't turn Him away from you. The Apostle Paul that wrote 14 books of your New Testament, he said, I've asked God three times. Three times I've questioned God. Take this from me. And all three times God said, no. My grace is sufficient for you. You aren't doing wrong when you say, God, I don't know where this is coming from. God, I don't know why this is happening. God, I tried to be faithful to you. God, I go to church. I worship. I pay my tithes. I pray. There's nothing wrong with it, friend. If you can talk that way to your husband or your wife or your kids or your best friend, you can talk that way to God because He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You're not going to offend Him. He's the one that said, not Nothing can separate me from the love of God. You don't get this stuff if you're not walking with Him. If you're walking by a bunch of rules and regulations, you're not getting it. Believe me, I got enough rules for all of us. I've preached enough regulations for everybody. I'm not backing up on one standard of the church. Brother Hall pastored here before me. Pastored 34 years and he set some rules for this church that 19 years later are still the rules of this church. I'm not changing the rules he made. I had a man ask me one day, say, Preacher, why in the world do you make us men do this and that? And I said, you know there's about 389,000 rules in the Bible for women. And there's two or three for men. So I made some up for you guys that you're going to do just to be fair. (laughs) You might as well go be a Muslim. Sir, if you're not going to live by no rules, but insist on your wife by by living by all the rules. Somebody going to have to explain to me when she's walking ten steps behind him in the Muslim religion. Can't see nothing but her eyes through a little slit in a whatever that thing's called, hijab or something like that. And he's out with a muscle shirt on and short pants and a beard, smoking cigarettes and cussing like a sailor. You be careful you're not a UPC Muslim. You got rules for your wife and kids and you don't live by none. Now you can sit there right now and think, what in the world does that have to do with this sermon? Nothing. Nothing. It's good preaching whether anybody says good preaching or not. There's actually a lot more in the Bible for men than we give credit for. Like the Bible says, will a man rob God? There's no place in the Bible that says, will a woman rob God? i got to get off this, don't I? Where was I? Put my glasses back on. When I lay my glasses down and walk away from this podium, you're just getting sermon number two. Or part of it. And most of you are looking at me like Asher is right now. I promise you. I promise you. And if this isn't right, and the scripture don't bear it up, I will stand in this pulpit and apologize. I promise you on my knowledge of the scripture. I promise you on the experience of my relationship with God. That when you choose to walk with the Lord. 
God is there all the time. He don't take a break. He don't walk away from you. The Bible said God will never leave us and never forsake us. I promise you that in every circumstance and every situation, God is there. I promise you that in every test and trial, God is there. I promise you in times of pain and suffering, God is there. I promise you in times of loss, God is there. I promise you that when everything that can go wrong does go wrong, God is there. I promise you that when we even make time, we fail to make time for Him, He is still there. When we're not aware of Him, He is still there. When our actions don't please Him, He is still there. Even when our faith wavers, He is still there. Even when we feel lost, He is still there. You need to get it in your mind that the number one most important thing I can do is walk with the Lord. David said, I was young and now I'm old. I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I can tell you I'm 65 years old. I've had the Holy Ghost 58 years. And not one time. Everybody hold up one finger. Not one time has God failed me. There may not be enough fingers in this room for the times I've failed him. But not one time has God failed me. Not one time has God abandoned me. Not one time has God ignored my petitions. Not one time has God forsaken me. Not one time that voice I know that belongs to him and when I hear it I know it's his voice not one time has that voice said boy you're on your own not one time the Lord will be there I promise you even when you feel like giving up the Lord will be there I promise you when friends turn their back on you the Lord will be there when everything that can go wrong does go wrong the Lord will be there when it feels like all hope is gone The Lord will be there when the future is unknown. The Lord's going to be with you when things get tough. The Lord's going to be there when there are more unknowns than knowns. The Lord is going to be with you when life is filled with wicked twists and turns. God's going to be with you when you get bad news. God's going to be with you when life is hard. God's going to be with you when you don't know which way to turn. If... You're walking with Him. Say amen, somebody. Stand with me if you will. Sometimes you don't see the hand of God until somewhere down the road. You don't always see it in the day or in the time of trouble. Let's do a little survey here real quick. How many would lift a hand and say, Preacher, After some big situation in my life, days, weeks, months later, I look back and then I could recognize the hand of God in my life. Seven weeks ago Friday, I had a wreck. The only bad wreck I've been in in my lifetime other than a fender bump or something like that once or twice. Never had a speeding ticket, never had a wreck on my record. I've not had anything like that. I've ministered to people, but boy, did I have a bad one. I went off the road 45 miles an hour into a ditch. Every time I hit one of those driveways that crossed the ditch, my truck sailed. I only remember hitting the first ditch because I hit my head on that bar you hold on to and it knocked me out. So I only remember the first three or four seconds of the accident. I ended up four houses down the road, and these houses are on about half acre, one acre lots. They're not just right beside each other, but four houses down the road, I ended up in their driveway. The people that were behind me stopped, helped me. My 
let, let me just stop and tell you some things that I didn't know that night. I didn't know till even a few weeks ago. Where I went down in a ditch and hit that culvert, sent my truck sailing, knocked me out. The policeman told me, said, the fact that you were knocked out, it said it's why drunks don't get hurt as bad in accidents as people that's not drunk. Now, that's not your license to go get drunk and drive. <laughs> he said, the fact that you were knocked out, you weren't resisting, you weren't fighting, you weren't, which would have all caused you to get hurt worse trying to control it. Knock me out. The policeman, when he gets up by my truck and they're getting ready to put me on the stretcher and put me in an ambulance, the p policeman said, sir, your airbag doesn't look like your airbag went off. I said, no, it didn't. And him and the EMS and the fireman stood right outside my door fussing about my airbag didn't go off. When my truck, when they found me, my truck was sitting in the driveway of the fourth house. The man that owned the house, his truck was here. I was coming down the front of the houses by the road this way, but when I woke up, my truck was parked right beside his. Some way it got turned in beside his without hitting his. I'm knocked out. The brake was hit, didn't hit his truck or his house, and my truck's in park. Cecil's over next door. He's a state policeman that got injured in the line of duty. Cecil went out there and took pictures and checked out the scene and did all of that. And Cecil said, Pastor, it's amazing because the ditch is here and about 12 or 13 foot off the ditch, there's a telephone pole in every one of those yards of the houses. The telephone pole's about 12 or 13 feet over. And he said, your truck with no driver, you knocked out, hitting the ditch, going sailing through the air and all of that, and you didn't hit one telephone pole in four yards going down through there. The truck parked itself. When the ambulance guy said to me, he said, now that's amazing that your airbag didn't go off. I said, it's God. He said, what do you mean it's God? I said, my doctor told me I'll write you a letter. In case you haven't noticed up here, I look so slim from where you're sitting. I'm a big boy. And my doctor said, the airbag in your model truck goes 17 inches and pops. It hits like a brick wall when it's fully open and then it goes down. He said, your problem is your chest is only 12 inches from the steering wheel. And if the airbag goes off, he said, it's gonna damage your heart, it's gonna break your ribs, something will probably be punctured and you'll probably die. So he said, I'm gonna give you a letter so you can go to DMV, get permission to disable the steering wheel airbag from your truck. I hadn't got the letter from him, I hadn't went to DMV, and the airbag is still enabled, but it didn't go off. In what is arguably the nicest SUV on the road, the most modern, the most high tech, the airbag didn't work. The truck got parked and put in park right beside another man's truck. It threaded the needle between ditches and telephone poles. I was knocked out so I didn't know what I was going through. And I woke up to my truck had 911 on the phone. My truck called 9 I didn't call 911. I woke up to the 911 lady saying, "Sir, we think you've been in a crash. This is 911. Are you okay? Do you need an ambulance? And then I, on my watch, my watch has got Elisa on the phone because Elisa and my wife are my emergency contacts. And my watch called Elisa and she's hollering, Dad, are you okay? Dad, what happened? Say, oh, all that stuff. Telephone poles, ditch, knocked out, parking the car, no airbag, 911, Elisa. Oh, you believe what you want to believe. But I believe there's big dividends 
that come with walking with the Lord. Sometimes we don't know it till later on. How He protected us. How He took care of us. How He kept us safe. How He preserved our life. I text every singer in our church yesterday. Does anybody know the song, I want Jesus to walk with me? Nobody did. Nobody volunteered. I wish I could sing. I'd sing it for you right now. I've been singing it all week long because I'm telling you, God let me know. No matter what you're going through, the answer is walk with the Lord. Walk with the Lord. If the only time you're religious is between 10 and 12 on Sunday morning, and you won't be religious again till next week, that means you visit with the Lord. That ain't walking with the Lord. Ha. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want to put my hand in His hand. And I want Him to keep me safe. I want Him to help me make right decisions. And yeah, I want Him to tell me when I'm wrong. I want the preachers to come and then we're going to open the altar. And My whole message today has been a challenge to us to walk with the Lord. I'm not going to beg folks to come and pray. i got a feeling this building's full of folks that are wanting me to stop so you can pray. Give them just about 30 seconds to get in space. Come on, either take your Geritol or move, one of the two. Thank you. This altar's open, folks. You want Jesus to walk with you. I want you to come down here and crowd into this altar. And these preachers aren't going to quit praying until they've helped pray with every single person that walks down to the front of this church today. You want Jesus to walk with you? Come on. You got a lot of questions? Come on. You're confused? Come on. You're frustrated? Come on. Come on down here. Let one of these men or women of God lay hands on you and let God begin to move on you and give you strength in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. If I preach this message today for one person, I am that one person. But I got a feeling I preached it for a bunch of folks. You need a miracle in your life. You need to know that God's on your side and that God loves you. Oh, I need answers to some questions. You want to go with mom? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. Yeah, call on Him. Call out to Him. Renew your commitment to Him. 
make a brand new commitment to Him. I want Jesus to walk with me. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. I want Jesus to walk with me. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Pour your heart out to Him. Pour your heart out to Him. All over this place, God is doing a mighty work right now. God is ministering to you right now. No matter what you need today, God is going to do it. Come on, will you lift up your voice? Lord, will you lift up your voice in the name of Jesus? No matter what you came in here today with, God is going to do it. God is a healer. God is a deliverer. God is your salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Today is your day. God is going to fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Come on. In the name of Jesus, he'll never leave you. Come on. In the name of Jesus, he will walk with you. He will guide you. He will order your steps. Come on. Put your trust in him. Put your faith in him. God will never leave you nor forsake you. God is here right now. No matter what you are going through, you are going to leave different. You are going to leave changed. You're going to leave transformed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Go ahead in the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up your voices. Lift up your voices all across this place. Hallelujah. Come on, put your life into his hands. Let him order your steps today. He is a healer. He is a healer. There is nothing too hard for him. There is nothing too hard for him. Come on, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, he's doing it. He's doing it right now. He's doing it right now. In the name of Jesus. He's doing it right now. Hallelujah. This is your day. This is the day of salvation. Hallelujah. No matter what you need, bring it to the Lord. No matter what you need, bring it to him right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, I press toward the mark. Oh, I press toward the mark. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He will walk with you. He will guide you. He will carry you. He loves you. He cares for you. He cares for you today. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless your home. He wants to bless your finances. He wants to bless your health. He wants to bless you on the job. He wants to bless your family. He wants to do it. He wants to be in your life today. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, it's not too late. It's too, not too late. If you need prayer, I want to encourage you. Come to this altar. Let a minister lay hands on you. Come to this altar while there's still time. Come to this altar. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. Don't leave here the same way you came.
Don't leave here the same way you came. The Lord wants to transform you. The Lord can do it. Just put your life into his hands. Just put your life into his hands. Come on. Come on, there is still time. Come on, there is still time. If you need prayer, just lift up your hands. Let one of these ministers pray for you. I promise you, you will be different. I promise things will be different. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, this is your moment. This is your moment. Hallelujah, let God interrupt your life today. Make him number one in your life today. He loves you. He cares for you. He will order your steps. Just put your trust in him. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. Come on, the Lord is touching people right now. The Lord is moving right now. The Lord is moving all across this building right now. And he is doing a great work. He is doing a great work today. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Let God speak to you in the name of Jesus. Come on, there is power in his name. There is salvation in his name. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is victory in the name of Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. That's it, ma'am. That's it, ma'am. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. That's it, sir. Hallelujah. That's it. Hallelujah. The name of Jesus. Come on. If you need prayer, if you need prayer, I encourage you. Make your way down to the altar and lift up your hands and let God touch you right now in the name of Jesus you don't have to leave carrying that weight you don't have to leave the same way you came this is your moment this is your hour hallelujah the name of Jesus that's it in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus hallelujah Come on. That's it. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. God is doing it right now. Right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, keep pressing. Keep pressing. Hallelujah, keep pressing. Keep pressing. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. God is getting ready to do it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we give you glory. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Clap your hands and give God glory for the beautiful work that has been done in this house today. 
Amen. We want to invite anyone who, if you've received the Holy Ghost for the first time, we want you to invite you to come up on the platform with us. We want to, amen, meet you and give God glory for what he's done in your life. Anybody that's been received the Holy Ghost for the first time, amen, then you just get with one of the ministers, pastors. If you were praying with somebody for the first time, we want to invite them up onto the platform. Anybody that was refilled with the Holy Ghost, amen. Amen. Join us up here on the platform. Anybody refilled with the Holy Ghost? Amen. How many of you are glad you were in service this morning? Come on. Hallelujah. What a powerful message that God has given us. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Amen. Just as a reminder... Amen. Just as a reminder coming up this weekend, amen, we're going to be celebrating the wedding, amen, with the Torres family and with the Fergozo family, and we're excited about that. That's going to take place this Saturday. Go ahead and give them a good hand. Francis, amen. Somebody say, help, help me, Lord. Amen. Francis and Fergozo, amen. Praise God. I probably should have wrote something down. Yeah, that's all right. The, uh, so I'm turning 55 this year. I don't know what that means. But, the, uh, but either way, uh, we want to invite you. The wedding is open to the entire church. We're excited, amen, to celebrate with this young couple. And uh, we're going we're gonna to celebrate with them by showing up and, and uh, showing our support. Also, we want to remind you, this coming Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. We know what we're doing on Sunday morning, amen. Do everything in your power to bring somebody here that needs the Holy Ghost or that has never been baptized. They need to be born again of the water and the Spirit. This coming Sunday, you want to bring them to church so that they can experience what God has given so graciously to us. Somebody said amen. Past Brother Mike, Evangelist Mike Easter is going to be with us Sunday morning and Sunday night. And Pastor did clarify that Sunday night is for all apostolic churches to come together. And we're going to have a unification service. Amen. And we're just going to celebrate the glorious truth that God has given us. Aren't you thankful that you know, amen, this truth and a revelation that hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen. And him alone should we serve. And so we're going to be celebrating that next Sunday in our 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. services. We do invite you to come back tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to have a service. Pre-service prayer is going to be again at 530. And just to uh, reiterate the announcement that Pastor put out there, June 3rd and 4th, we're going to have Warren Finney with us. He already explained the great way that God uh, ministered and transformed the life of this uh, man, this preacher who was not in truth, but God graciously gave him the revelation, and he's going to speak to us on Saturday at MIT, and so we need to make sure that's on your calendar on, and for the weekend of June 3rd and 4th, and then also on that Sunday, we're going to see God do glorious things. Amen. Clap your hands and give God glory. Amen. So great to hear from our pastor. Hear the move of God. See this move of God. Thank you for being here today. Amen. We love you. You are dismissed in Jesus' name.